It's good to see you all. Um, we're going to begin, and um, I just want to welcome everyone to the Tuesday Lasses Lunchtime Lectures. Uh, I am Professor Sarah McKinnon, um, the current faculty director. And before I introduce our speaker, I also want to let you know we have a few upcoming events that are going to be happening next week and very exciting. Um, so we are co-sponsoring with the Human Rights Program and the International Division, a speaker, um, Antonio Urajola, who will be here on Wednesday of next week at 4 p.m. in the Pile Center. So there's some flyers over here um, for that if you're interested. Um, all this semester, we have an art exhibit at the Hillel Center called um, dancing with the devil. I think yes. singular devil, oh, plural. Yes. That, I always have to think, is it singular or plural? <laughs> plural. And also there's an event associated with that on Wednesday, no, Thursday of next week, the 19th. Um, Alberto, what time is that? Is that 7 p.m.? It's over there. I should have looked, but look for that event. We'll be having a reception that is going along with that exhibition. The exhibition is uh, beautiful. Six. Oh, 6, 6 p.m. Hillel Center. There's a reception. Um, the curator will be there to chat with us about the, the, the event. So please join us for that as well. All right, and now it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Professor Adriana Angel. Uh, Professor Angel's research questions the role of rhetoric in the implementation and maintenance of democratic political structures in Latin America. She's the lead editor of an impactful volume in rhetoric and communication studies entitled Rhetorics of Democracy in the Americas. Professor Angel has published over 30 articles and book chapters in top communication journals. And in these outlets, she interrogates how political campaigns and social movements intent on addressing themes such as corruption, fracking, and sustainability shape people's daily lives in a wide range of Latin American contexts. Uh, her work is also at the cutting edge of conversations about decoloniality within the field of rhetoric and communication. And so she really joins a small group of scholars who are helping us to think otherwise about daily realities and um, political alternatives. So it is my pleasure to introduce my friend, um, Adriana Hed to talk with us about the transformation of corruption discourse. Okay, so thank you very much for being here and for this invitation. It's an honor for me to be in the University of Wisconsin-Madison and to know Lassis and all of you also. Uh, thank you to the people who are connected through Zoom. So in very general terms, uh, in this presentation, I will talk about my research on Guatemalan corruption. That is the way in which corruption is communicated um, in Guatemala. This study, began in 2015 uh, when I started to hear in the news about demonstrations against corruption in Guatemala. My husband is from Guatemala and his family went to the demonstrations every Saturday with their dogs, their children. Uh, these were very peaceful demonstrations and they lasted for 10 weeks, 10 Saturdays until they made the president of Guatemala resign. So they call this media and academics the first Guatemalan spring. In addition, I had done my doctoral dissertation at Ohio University about the rhetorics of corruption in, what, in Colombian discourse. So I was definitely very interested on what was happening in Guatemala back in 2015. And I decided to study how different speakers construct the notion of corruption in Guatemala. I began, as I said, this study in 2015 and completed that in 2016. And I published a chapter in the book that uh, Sarah just mentioned, uh, Rhetorics of Democracy in the Americas, that I published with Professor Michael Borredward from the University of Texas and Nancy Gomez from Universidad del Norte in Barranquilla. Uh, this year, Guatemala celebrated uh, a few weeks ago presidential elections. And again, citizens went to the streets in very peaceful demonstrations 
to ask uh, the president and the attorney general to respect uh, their votes. Citizens decide to peacefully go to the streets to ensure that the vote will be respected because the foreign attorney general and the foreign president, they are saying that elections were not legitimate. So people are very much in the streets, but also uh, conducted very peaceful demonstrations. So considering this situation, I decided to study how the discourse and rhetorics of corruption have changed from what happened in 2015 to what is happening right now in 2023. And that's why my slide is called Two Scenes, Two Guatemalan Springs, and Two Moments of the Sky, in order to make that comparison and to analyze how the discourse on corruption uh, has changed. So why to study Guatemala? Guatemala is one of the most corrupt countries in the world, but so are many others in Latin America. It's like our reality. I decided to study Guatemala because scholars in the communication field rarely pay attention to Guatemala and in general to Central America. And also because in Guatemala we have these two interesting moments of um, corruption. I think that also Guatemala offers an interesting uh, example to the world of peaceful demonstrations. It is not like in my country, in Colombia, that every time that we have a demonstration, the fire, everything, the public transportation stops in Guatemala, the, the situation is different, uh, with the exception of yesterday, uh, that, that they have problems with um, a few cases of violence, but it's, it's, it's not usual in that. Uh, in these demonstrations, family participated with children, dogs, music, and even the rituals of the indigenous population, which is pretty significant uh, in Guatemala. Um, considering these two springs and these two contexts, this was my research guiding question. How has, and read the discourse surrounding corruption, change between the significant political events of 2015 and 2023 in Guatemala? And how do these discourses reflect the broader rhetorical strategies employed within the national political discourse? To explore uh, these questions, I analyzed the two springs. You can see like uh, the comparison in the slide. The first occurred in 2015 with a specific case that is called La Línea or the telephone line. La Línea was a system through which customs officials created a parallel payment system in which businessmen pay less taxes in exchange for bribes. This network of corrupt officials created a telephone line to negotiate the bribes, and that's why it's called the line. In 2015, the International Commission Against Corruption in Guatemala, CC, released more than 60,000 recordings implicated high-ranking officials, including ministers, the vice president, and the president. So as a result, the president resigned, and after the peaceful demonstrations, the 10 Saturdays, the president resigned. Meanwhile, CC, the International Commission, Excuse me, who is this president? This president is Otto Perez. Otto Perez was the president at that time. Uh, and the CICIC started denouncing other cases of corruption related to health system and policies. This uh, the second scene, so the moment that we are experiencing in, in Guatemala right now in 2023 is the presidential election a few uh, weeks ago. And the runoff candidates were Sandra Torres, a, fir a former first lady who divorced from her husband in order to uh, present the election. She was running for the third time. And Bernardo Arevalo, the candidate of Movimiento Semilla or Seed Movement. Which is very interesting is that the political party of Bernardo Arevalo, Movimiento Semilla, was originated in the first Guatemalan Spring. Um, however, despite Arevalo winning with more than 60% of the votes, the public prosecutor and other organisms are saying that his election was not legitimate and people are afraid that they don't allow him to assume office in January. So citizens have gone to the streets once again, and they are um, making 
their voices here to, to make their votes respected. I start from the idea that corruption requires rhetorical work because it is a diffuse and culturally based concept. There is no consensus about what corruption is. What is corrupt in a region might not be in a different context. So scholars distinguish among three different types of corruption regarding this. So it might be black if we are talking about high impacting practices like La Línea that I just explained. While corruption is related to commonly accepted practices, for example, in Latin America, for some people, it is normal to cut the line. It is not uh, in other places. And great corruption refers to practices about which we are not sure. For example, forging your sister's signature to do her a favor. Because it's your sister, you are not doing anything wrong, but it's like a gray zone. We also talk about public and private corruption according to the agent performing the act. And finally, regarding the why of corruption, which is a, a, a very important question. We have behavioristic explanations that say that it depends on the behavior of the individual, but we also have a structural explanations that says, no, it's not about the individual, but it's about the system, the general structure. But once again, there is no consensus because some research studies show that it is a behavioristic problems and other um, conclude that it's a problem of the system. From a communication standpoint, because I am a communication scholar, corruption implies the communication of a situation that must be hidden or denied by the agent performing the act. But at the same time, it needs to be made public by media or the judicial uh, authorities. Both the agent involved in corruption and their accusers must establish solid accounts. So one person says uh, you that um, this that you did is corruption, and the other said no, it is not corruption, or it is normal, or I am not guilty, it wasn't me. So it becomes important to talk about proof, facts, evidence, which are rhetorical devices of the scientific field, but they are very important to establish in the discourse what is corrupt and what is not, and who is guilt and who is not. I understand rhetoric like Jonathan Potter and Barry Rupert do, that is uh, um, the use of language to find a common ground, to achieve identification. Um, I think that with, with these scholars, of course, that the rhetoric uh, is a dimension of discourse rather than a type of bombastic speech that seeks to deceive people. More than a deliberative action that the speakers use to manipulate audiences, uh, rhetoric involves the use of language to place the discourse and the individuals in the same textual uh, position. To study the communication about Guatemalan corruption, I assembled a representative collection of studies that would allow me to understand the vocabularies through which corruption is communicated in Guatemala in both time periods. So from both 2015 and 2023, I collected discourses of politicians, but also from citizens. Because so I think it's important to see the other type of discourse. I collected uh, these discourses through YouTube pieces, uh, media stuff, presentations, debates, and I analyzed 18, art, uh, 18 pieces for the 2015 and 17 pieces for 2023. That is more than 400 pages of transcription. And on those pages, I perform a rhetorical cluster analysis. I follow Kenneth Burke's methodology to identify the main vocabularies, the main terms, uh, words through which corruption is communicated. At, uh, at this point, it's important to take into account that vocabularies are not neutral, but they define programs of action. They make us see reality in a specific ways. So calling a uh, bribe as a corrupt act has implications related to what we are doing in uh, what we're going to do in relation to that. So vocabularies work as deterministic screens through which individuals perceive the world is like the glasses through which we see the world. 
In these uh, two slides, you can read as an example to have a, a general idea some of the voices in the context of 2015. Uh, the first one is um, by the former president, and the second one is uh, one intervention from a citizen. You can read it. Is that out of the is that the former president? Yes. Mm -hmm. And here we have some examples of the current voices. And I want to read that corruption start from the top and trickle down. If the leader is not corrupt, they can hold others accountable. But if the corruption starts at the top, it contaminates everyone else. That's how it works. That's what we have. And the same one. Sorry, let me just let me just fix this. An idea about, idea about what the discourses are for both politicians and citizens. Uh, so in the, this slide summarizes the main terministic experience through which politicians and citizens communicated about corruption both in 2015 and 2023. In the first case, that is 2015, the narrative goes like this. Corruption is a type of fraud that the Guatemalan system permits. Corruption threatens democracy and therefore the viability of the country. And the denunciation and representation of Guatemalan corruption is the result of US interventionist strategies. The narrative for the 2023 discourse about corruption is a little different. In this case, it goes like this. Corruption acts like a systemic contamination that weakens institutions and stops development, is broader. The solution is citizen engagement that is, that is using transparency and accountability. Uh, and if change doesn't happen, people will go to the streets. So let's examine this um, for a minute. If we examine in detail the clusters for the first uh, moment of the study, that is the main case of La Línea in 2015, we find a first cluster that, that is Broad, and it includes two main terms or two main feministic screens. The first one is abuse and the second is invitation. So corruption is an abuse that agents do for personal gain. It's not a problem of values. We were talking about the behavioristic explanation or a serious violation of the law, but it is an invitation made by the system. So you are corrupt because the system invites you because everything is settled so that you can take advantage of that. And abuse means, at the same time, that corruption is not a very serious legal or ethical problem, but it's something that is uh, allowed for you to, to perform. The second cluster is democracy. At that time, here politicians and citizens emphasize the consequences of corruption that are a threat to the young democracy. In Guatemala, we are talking about more or less 30 years of, of democracy. It is interesting to notice that here the consequences are not poverty or punishment, like it would be in the current discourse of corruption, but the viability of the country as a state that is recognized by the international community. It was very important for the former president, uh, Otto Perez, to have the international community um, recognizing Guatemala as a democracy because of the current, um, the past uh, 
dictatorship. And the third cluster is interventionism as the president accused the USA to intervene and manipulate the country. When uh, President Otto, Morales, Otto Perez Morales resigned, he often, he repeatedly said, um, this is happening because of the United States. They are intervening in our country. I am just a victim uh, of this situation, but I didn't do anything wrong. And he keep repeating and repeating uh, the, same, the same narrative. For the 2023 uh, analysis, if we examine the deterministic screens in detail, uh, we find some differences. Uh, you will notice a first cluster that is named system systemic contamination, in which corruption is presented as a degenerative intrusion that asks for a process of cleaning. That is a process that, that requires sanitization. So it is not anymore a fraud, but is a kind of contamination that created the entire system. And it asks for a process of cleaning. The second cluster is development. So it is not anymore an isolated case, but we are talking, and here both politicians and citizens, they repeatedly say that uh, development that corruption is um, the cause for non-institution in Guatemala is working as, as it should. So development presents the impact of corruption in the debilitation of institutions and therefore in the stagnation of development. It is related to the first cluster that is systemic contamination as corruption not only contaminates but also erodes the structure and functioning of institutions. So we see here that the rhetoric is broader. And the third cluster, citizen engagement, which I, I like it a lot, uh, refers to the idea that cleaning up corruption happens in two main ways, transparency and accountability. Transparency implies that cleaning corruption involves exposing uh, agents of the different bodies. So what is doing the executive, body, the legislative, and the judicial, to, so that citizens can see what they are doing, and accountability that these powers also give answers to people. If transparency and accountability doesn't happen, people will go to the streets as many times as needed. And, and I read uh, many pieces in which citizens say, we will go to the streets as many times. And you can see that they have been in the, street, in the streets for, I think, one week now, and the country is almost paralyzed. Even the private institutions are in the streets, universities, uh, businessmen, because they are saying, if you don't want to be public and transparent, we will go in the streets in a very peaceful way, which I think is, is very interesting. So after analyzing both time periods, both springs, the two moments that I have been presented, um, we see some transformations in the discourse of corruption from 2015 to 2023. Corruption is not presented anymore as an isolated case, like La Linea, one anecdote, one, mm, yeah, one isolated case, but it is presented as a systemic contamination. It is not an ethical problem, but a contaminant that infects the system and requires sanitization to restore the functioning of institutions. Another interesting difference, I think, is that the U.S. is no longer viewed as the enemy, but, and uh, this is a, a big change, as a helper and an ally that can help citizenship to make corruption public and to make public officials accountable. So I don't think so, and especially because uh, this, the discourse has changed and they are seeing uh, the United States as an ally who is helping the citizenship to denounce these cases of corruption and also because these are very peaceful demonstrations. And like we've seen, you probably remember the Arab Springs or the, 
e, e em outros países em South America, these demonstrations might be violent, because violence is a way to get hurt. But in, in Guatemala, it's not. They are saying we are here, especially the indigenous population, we are here peacefully, and we will be very peaceful for a long time. But if you don't listen to us, we will need to go to other forms of discourse that could be more violent, but it is not happening right now. So I don't, I don't think so. Yes. Um, when you talk about in the second Guatemalan Spring international oversight, uh -huh. um, and you talked about the U.S., like who, who from the U.S. is considered mm -hmm. to be a player in that? That's very interesting because it is the, in, even in the discourse of 2015, they say the U.S. is either our enemy or our ally. In this case, it's our ally because they will help us. And they refer to the U.S. in very general terms, but in some cases, because the public prosecutors, she seems to be involved in some cases of corruption and probably drug trafficking, they refer to the U.S. as the judicial authorities. Uh, so they are asking, like they are saying in the streets, our judicial system in Guatemala doesn't work, so we can trust them. We need an international legal system that take actions that help us and that will be the judicial system in the United States as an ally for the citizens, but also for the politicians, especially for Arevalo, who is at the other uh, Movimiento Semilla trying to, I mean, he won the election, but we are not sure that, that he can assume office. So I would say that it is presented in the discourse very general, like the idea that Latin America have the, the US as the superpower, but specifically in the judicial, in the judicial authorities. One more question of related course. to that. Would they would they consider the Inter-American Court as a overseer also mm -hmm. in as oversight? Absolutely. And also the the international community is not only the US that they are talking about, but this is interesting because the narrative changed from 2015 uh, in relation to the US, but they are not also only talking about uh, the, the United States, but the entire uh, community. Mm, Latin American allies, um, Central American countries, European countries, citizens are saying anyone who can help us, please help us, but for, because there's a strong relationship with the United States and because if the prosecutor and some of the people in important institutions are involved in drug trafficking, money laundry, all of that, they, they will need the, the, the help from the United States. Thank you. Yes. I don't know if it's on topic, but do you think like if this stuff were to progressively change and get better, that maybe the Guatemalan government would be back open to um, U.S. and Guatemalan adoptions? Because I know it was shut down because of the amount of like child trafficking and corruption within the government. Um, so I'm just wondering if you if it got better, do you see them reopening like the border to adoptions, like transnational adoptions. Why don't we have uh, Professor Anhan finish her talk and then we'll do Q&A at the end because we also have some questions here. As well. Okay. That's okay. Does, yeah. does that work for you? Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, so that's the difference between the role of the international community and specifically the United States uh, in the discourse of corruption. And finally, uh, corruption has become what there is an author in rhetoric, uh, Kenneth Ward, he calls the ultimate uh, term. Um, uh, that means that uh, corruption is a fundamental idea through which the current discourse, Guatemalan citizens perceive and talk about the political uh, landscape. So for both politicians and citizens, corruption is viewed as the most pressing issue that shapes perceptions and feelings about their country. That didn't happen in 2015. Corruption was one problem. And of course, we have demonstrations for a very long time period 
when I was analyzing the, the, the discourses in the political campaign, all of them were about corruption. I was uh, impressed, like, I thought the journalists could ask uh, the candidates a question about health, police, economy, security, and in all answers, the candidates were talking about corruption. So corruption is the cause that uh, avoids the um, development of the country. So these are the main um, characteristics that I found that explain the transformation of this course in Guatemala from 2015 and 2020, and that help us understand the role not only of democracy, but also, I would say, the role of social movements in the democracy of Latin America, that uh, it goes beyond the act of voting. Of course, I am studying the context of a presidential election, but this is the, the active role of citizenship that the entire Latin American countries, um, I know that with Palestine and Israel, we are all paying attention to that, but also to Guatemala in Latin America, because this is, um, we don't want a dictatorship again, and we want uh, to be very respectful of, of democracies in, in our countries in Latin America. So, muchas gracias. Thank you very much for, for you listening to me. And yes, if you want to go with the questions. <laughs> So now we have time for questions. I don't. Did you have thoughts about this question um, um, that, was, that, was, that, was, that was asked a moment um, ago? Just about like international and like U.S. relations between like adoptions. I don't know if you see if you like with the amount of corruption. Do you see if it gets any better? Do you think that not necessarily just adoption? Could you see like the U.S. and Guatemala like working together again, just like internationally? I think so, um, but, but of course, um, the study that I did is not uh, directly involved in, in political relations, international relations, but in relation to the discourse of the country of Guatemala, absolutely, especially because Arevalo, the candidate uh, of Movimiento Semilla, the elect president uh, from Movimiento Semilla or C movement, he has very good relationships with the United States. And he, in his discourse, he appeals to the United States to show I'm not alone in this fight against corruption. So the U.S. is uh, helping me um, and also the, the citizenship who are in the streets. So it's very important because uh, the minutes that uh, the government interfere with violence, the more countries are watching this, the better. So I would say uh, I think so. Okay. Yes, we'll take a few and then I'm going to jump in with some from the chat. So maybe Gay and then Fidel. So I think there was a United Nations Commission into Corruption in Guatemala, and I wondered when that was and how it might be related to that shift around. Mm -hmm. I, I thought that 2015 issue, there was an international commission there, which was eventually kicked out by, mm -hmm. which is really different from 2023. Yeah, because for that commission in 2015, they were absolutely necessary to denounce corruption. Uh, but after that period, because we are talking many years, uh, the judicial system changed their agents. And that commission were, were no longer working in, was no longer working in, in Guatemala. It was kicked out. Absolutely. Yeah. By the government by the government because they didn't want. And Bernardo Arevalo in his discourse, he's uh, saying that constantly, we need the International Commission. So no, that was my question, whether wasn't some of the reason that the discourse changed uh -huh. is because Absolutely. the old regime kicks out the International Commission, calls it interventionist, and then this civilian movement, which is anti-corruption and anti the mm -hmm. incumbent government, is saying, no, we need the back. Uh -huh. Uh, and and it's very interesting because in this course it's like why we why do we need someone from a different country to say that we are doing things good or wrong? I mean, uh, we don't need more interventionism in our country. 
that's, that's the 2015 argument. Yeah, but, but, but some of the people who, who doesn't want international commissions are saying this even currently. Like, leave us alone. We are a country, a democracy. We know how to do it. We can fight against corruption. But citizens are saying, no, of course, no, we need an international commission. And, and this is a very complicated issue in Latin America because we have our past with interventionism and we don't want people uh, coming here to say, well, we have to go back. It's very interesting because in Guatemala, in the current discourse, it is presented as necessary. Please come here and watch watch and tell the world what is happening because we, we, we can do it by ourselves. I'm sorry, just, it seems like a case of social movement framing where the, mm. um, the original case of the, the US is the cause of all of the corruption mm -hmm. because you're trying to get rid of the external commission because you're in office. And in the second one, you have this grassroots movement that's trying to take over institutions and they're calling for intervention and as a way to get more transparent. It, it just seems like it's two different, two very different voices. So not so much that it's not the first Guatemalan uh -huh. discourse and then the second, but two very different mm. arguments being put forward by different social actors. Mm. Yeah, it's very interesting. And I didn't, I didn't thought, think of these expressions, social movement framing, but I think I will talk, yeah. <laughs> it's very interesting. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Fidel? Thank you for your presentation. It's interesting to do parallelism between, for example, Peru and Guatemala because some historians, some people talk about that because in Peru there is a mafia mercantilism in Congress that sequestrates and democracy in Peru. Even though the attorney, the um, uh, nation attorney is very corrupt and he only obeyed to the Congress, but I saw that it the same happened in Guatemala. Well, in Spanish, we can say we go to the Guatemala to Guatepeor with that <laughs> yeah. water wars in English. That happens a lot. And my opinion here is that uh, the, that case of fraud, no? Because, mm -hmm. for example, when here in USA, trying to allegate fraud, all the people come go and try to take that Capitolio, for example. Mm -hmm. Now that happened in Peru because Keiko Fujimori, the former candidate, only allegate fraud now in Guatemala, and that's very difficult because the idea of fraud uh, may have spread for all Latin American countries. And another idea that is necessary to analyze the idea of authoritarianism like the only solution for eliminate corruption. You know? For example, in Peru, many people um, worship adore to Bukele. Bukele is authoritarian, autocratic government, but that's the only solution for delinquency, the only solution for corruption. And even though some people try to imitate maybe at all other autocratic government, not China, mm -hmm. Xi Jinping, Putin in Russia. And that's a problem because some people say that de democracy is not good for com convey delinquency, for convey problems. Maybe oh, no, we need an autocracy the government, not a dictator, you know, when they say autocratic government we elected, no. And the problem is the not happen democratic could the you no know? democratic could the task in Peru happen that because they vacate several presidents in a short time. Mm -hmm. Also in Guatemala, in other countries, taking into account the idea of authoritarianism or use democratic when well, they kidnap it democratic institution to get, get the value to their that autocratic government. And we need to analyze that and we need to look another solution no? for try to combat that ideas. Mm -hmm. Just uh, um, a brief one. I, I think it's very interesting. And, and what I really like about studying uh, corruption in different uh, places, the discourses about corruption, is how it is presented. For example, the idea that you mentioned about authoritarianism uh, that is so present in El Salvador is not present in Guatemala. So how we are dealing in Latin America a lot with corruption, but we have different terministic screens to approach, to understand the solutions, as you were saying. So I think it's very interesting to compare because, it, as I was saying, corruption depends on the region. Also, the vocabularies and the solutions depends on the regions. Thank you. So we have to, I, I'm going to do some chat yeah, questions yeah. and then we'll go to you. Sure. So there are two questions from the chat that um, folks wanted some responses to. So first of all, did you look at all at pre-2005 corruption discourse? Did that enter into the analysis? That was one question. Mm -hmm. And then the other question was a methodological one. Mm -hmm. about the process of narrowing down to those um, sources that you analyzed for both 
for both texts. So if you could talk a little bit about your methodological process, okay, that'd be great as well. So I analyzed only the 2015 and 2023. I didn't uh, analyze any previous uh, moment. That was the first question. Okay, so, so but, or or I guess I think the question was more was did you notice in your analysis like your secondary reading if corruption was a thing prior to It was more like an anecdote, like one more episode. Uh, and because I was reading for that time also uh, political discourse, citizen discourse, and they were talking about corruption and other cases in the country. So it was a prior topic, but like a phenomenon among several others. Uh, but it was uh, it was not at present as as broad as in two thousand twenty three, and for the method, so because I was not and I am not in Guatemala, but I would have to uh, I would like to be there. So I analyzed this through mediated pieces, and um, for both time periods, time period, I collected as much as I could uh, from debates, uh, YouTube pieces, uh, blogs that citizens wrote, interviews made to them. And then I wrote down every, every piece and I performed the rhetorical cluster analysis. So I read the material, I read the material several times to identify the main vocabularies and then to try to group them in different semantic fields. And after that, it was very a very inductive process. The clusters emerge. That was like the brief explanation of the methodology. But I tried to collect as much as I could. Uh, to have the a very general idea. Of course, in those many pages, they are not talking all the time about corruption, especially in the 2015. Uh, but the context helped me to give sense about the terministic aspects. Okay. Um, there in Colombia, but also in many Latin American countries, especially during election times, it is common that. Uh, scandal related to corruption mm -hmm. you know, happens. And sometimes there are strategies or kind of a weapon to use mm -hmm. in order to, you know, to try to affect the other candidate or in a certain way to, to, to avoid that that person who at the point is uh, perhaps uh, uh, have a election favorite in a certain way, you know, happens uh, very often in, in many Latin American countries. So I wonder if perhaps during the, your research, perhaps in, in, in the um, rhetoric, you know, this, this idea about you know, corruption as a strategy mm -hmm. to affect the other appears mm -hmm. at some point. It, it is a way to perhaps uh, approach the issue in a certain way in Guatemala. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And in, in even if we are not in, in electoral times, and I called uh, this in my analysis, like uh, defensive rhetoric and offensive rhetoric, like one candidate is accusing the other, and that's why rhetoric is so important here to know how in the discourse they are not only constructing the notion and the meanings of corruption, but how they uh, make the other accountable. For, for corruption or not. So the question is, yes, it, it happens a lot as a way to say, you are corrupt and I am not. And it's uh, in the current, uh, not current because the election uh, has already happened, but like one month ago when they were in the debates, this was happening all the time. In all the answers, you are the corrupt, no, you are. And they were fighting about that and how they were mm, constructing the identity of the political candidates based on corruption. It was very, very interesting. I think mm, I agree with you that it, this is very common in, in Latin America because it's our reality. So in political election, to you, you take advantage of that in your discourse to undermine the other. Thank you. Yes. How, how do you, how, 
for 2015 where fraud was was there uh -huh. and then in 2023 systemic contamination mm -hmm. so how do you account for that because of citizen engagement over those years mm -hmm. Hmm. did that did that change the discourse to a whole mm -hmm. systemic mm -hmm. discourse if you want. i think that in part it has to do with Movimiento Semilla. The fact that the elect president comes from a political party that originated in the demonstrations of 2015. Because in demonstrations, uh, I live in, in a city when we have demonstrations like almost every week. So I wonder, should I go to the streets? What, what is the point of that? What is the result? something will happen if I go to the streets. But in this case, in 2015, people went to the streets and some years later, they have a president from those that emerged from the social movement. So I think that it has to do with that, that uh, Arevalo, um, they frame the current situation of Guatemala as uh, the main problem of the current situation of Guatemala as corruption, but also citizens, because he came from the citizens movement, so they uh, they echo the ideas of, of Arevalo. So I think that it has to do with the social movement behind, and also um, it has to do with the the fact that CICIC were no longer was no longer in Guatemala, the International Commission. So this is a way to ask, please, we need help. And this is not an isolated case like La Línea. It's not that some businessman, and of course the president, but it is the entire system and all institutions. So I think that what that could explain the difference between what is interesting for me in systemic contamination is that. For example, when I studied Colombia, the main terministic screen was corruption as a legal problem. So in the if corruption is a legal problem, you have a very clear solution, which is institutions, judicial authorities. But in systemic contamination, it is ambiguous. It is like who has to do the cleanup? Citizens, of course, in the discourse, but it is not like a, there is a um, uh, direct institution that has to do uh, to solve the problem because the other huge question here uh, is solution. There is not the solution is cleaning, but that is like how is cleaning going to the streets? Can we go to the streets and how many days? can survive Guatemala with the economy paralyzed because of the demonstration. So the solution is not clear in this deterministic screen, I think. Yeah, go ahead. Yes. I have three questions. Okay. <laughs> okay. Only, but uh, you can answer what uh, you think is the best or combine or whatever. The first one is knowing that the majority of the population is indigenous in mm -hmm. Guatemala and that they have been very severely repressed many times. Mm. How much have they been able to participate in this new movement? Mm -hmm. would be my first question. Uh -huh. The other one is I see there's an agent that is missing here, which, which is the social media. Mm -hmm. What is yeah. the role? Mm -hmm. And maybe that cites one way or the other, depending on, on who is. Mm -hmm running these social media mm -hmm. and the third one it seemed to me that you talked only about international participation mm -hmm. especially from the united states yes but who are the actors there is it the government or is it also i think in in 223 that's what i suspect also people work of the grassroots yeah who are fighting against corruption in other countries well, I think the three questions are sort of related, but go as far as... Yeah, <laughs> I will try my best. Thank you. Yes, the indigenous population have been very active in both times, 2015 and 2023. And it is, uh, I, I really like to see the videos when they are preparing because they are, they 
Mm, they go with their rituals. It's not only to go to walk, but they bring music and dance and, and all the, the, the rituals that they have um, to the demonstrations. I hope that there won't be strong repressions against them as they have experience for the history of the country, but it is specifically because of that history of repression that they are going and they they are saying, we vote for Arevalo because they are, he is taking us into account. He is looking at us, considering, and you are going to ignore that vote uh, so we, we can't uh, stay without doing anything. Um, for the second uh, question, social media, I know it's, it's a very important uh, agent. I didn't study the social media um, discourse, but of course it has had a very important role in, the, in both demonstrations. In fact, for the 2015, uh, the organization, and, and of, of course for the 2023, but for 2015, the demonstrations were organized through social media. That, that's the way to organize people and to say, don't be violent, we are going this and this, is in both cases uh, through social media. And not only Arevalo, but other Young people in the demonstrations also became elected for public uh, public seats in different institutions, and they were doing their campaign through social media. So it is it is very important. Um, in relation to your third question, absolutely. The uh, I, maybe I talk about much about. Uh, the United States role in the manifestation, but the protagonist here, the main uh, agent, the principal agent in these manifestations, both in 2015 and 2023, are grass movements and the people and the indigenous population, but also workers, students, and, which is very interesting for me also because in Colombia is mainly young, the young population. So students uh, in the university who don't have class, so let's go to demonstrate. But here it is the workforce, it is young people, indigenous community organized through social media and other ways, but of course they are the main uh, agents talking against corruption and making some important changes, I would say. Those are people in Guatemala. Oh, I, I was thinking of who from the United States, if there was any participation of people. Oh, uh, no. That, I, that's my question. Uh, yeah, I, I didn't understand. Especially institutions, but also mm. groups that are interested in Guatemala and okay. trying to uh. help the situation. Uh -huh. I didn't uh, find them in the discourses, in the material that I was analyzing, but, but they are probably involved because uh, it, it often happens in the... Yeah, I'm sorry that I, I didn't understand the question at first, but I, I understand your point now. Yeah, not only the high-ranking judicial authorities, but grass movements, I, I, I guess they are, they are involved, but I, I, I didn't see that in the material. Because in the first... Part, they talk about interventions mm -hmm. uh -huh. government, uh -huh. not uh -huh. the grassroots movements. Uh -huh. quite, uh, That's why the question. Thank you. Let's just make an uh, just on that point briefly. Something that um, I have noticed since the Biden administration took office here in the United States, uh, Biden's primary advisor on Latin American affairs is Juan Gonzalez. He's, uh, uh, he's from a Colombian family, Colombian American. And um, when he does interviews publicly, this is not a systematic study like you have done, mm -hmm. but just something that I've noticed is that when he will talk, when he talks about Central America, he talks about the problem of an entrenched class system that mm -hmm. It sustains itself through corruption. And he won't do that for any other region. 
strange. Well, yeah, not so strange. You want to comment on that, Kay? <laughs> yeah, I do desperately. <laughs> I don't really have a question. I mean, it's just related to this. I mean, this is the, this is the one like the one place where a you know a Biden administration official of importance in talking about foreign affairs will talk about class structure. And it's related to the existence of corruption, I think, because that is something that a, an area where they think that they can make a difference. Although, you know, in Sisik's case, uh, is a United Nations mm -hmm. body rather than the U.S. Nations. It's funded by the U.S., right? But through the United Nations. And so that <laughs> creates a layer <laughs> I, I, just, I feel like it's also really important to remember the history that between the two cases, your two cases, there's a really important moment that we haven't mentioned. The guy who was elected after the Paris resigns, the guy who's elected after him, was it Morales? Yeah, who is the who's the um the supposed to be the anti-corruption person? Sisig then finds him and much of his family guilty of corruption and he kicks them out of the country. So there's this really massive moment in Guatemalan history of everybody in Guatemala realizes it's not just Paris, it's not just a little, it's a pattern of institutional corruption. And actually to be fair, the same thing is spreading across all of Latin America. I mean, the Odebrecht scandal made people across Latin America aware of how much even the anti-corruption presidents in all kinds of different countries turn out, oh, they knew that their vice president was deeply involved in that. Yeah, you yeah. know, the corruption, the awareness of corruption and the institutionalization of it has really shifted. And what I think happens in the 23 elections is that you get this kind of grassroots movement of, um, it's not gonna be enough to just, you know, talk about going after uh -huh. one fraud. Yeah. You know, it's a systemic issue and we have to take care of it. And a lot of people have smartphones, they can share information. And a lot more people have some kind of education mm -hmm. than had even 10 years ago. And it really affects how people, the same thing is happening in South Africa. So I've been watching it in many different Which places. Which makes so much sense why systemic contamination yeah. is the frame exactly. that really emerges. Because exactly. um, it's not enough to just go after yeah. Paris because the next right. president did the same thing. I mean, he was a comedian, like a clown. <laughs> His profession was, was a comedian and he said, I am a comedian who, who wants to make laugh about corruption and, and the problems of our country. And some years after that, he was accused of corruption. And like, I remember, uh, uh, the, the opposition Torres person mm -hmm. had been in the government yeah, as, a, as a minister, not just the wife of the... I, yeah, yeah, <laughs> that history is it's, it's interesting. Yeah. Folks, we are at our time, but thank you. Oh, thank uh, you very, very much. much. All right, Zoom people, we're leaving. Thank you for joining us.